Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Daily Objective. And today is everybody's favorite day of the week, Freedom Friday. Um, now, when people think about freedom, of course, uh, they're not sure what, what that really entails. Is it primarily about expression? Is it primarily about um, sexual acts? But I think it's primarily the right to produce. And that obviously requires focus, uh, adherence to the facts on the ground, and some creativity. So today we're actually going to be talking about creativity. And this is a topic largely misunderstood and unknown to many people. And we're going to try to solve that here today. I've been listening to Leonard Peikoff's uh, lecture series called Understanding Objectivism. It's a must, trust me. And he talks about the many false dichotomies that, pe that many people live with, such as um, um, reason versus, um, uh, okay, I actually forgot where I was going with that one, but like love versus sex or ideas versus concretes. You know, ultimately it's mind versus body. Um, and I think uh, one that we can actually raise today that many people live with is like <laughs> rationality versus uh, creative freedom. How about that one? Rationality versus creative freedom. Or for this particular audience, we might even be able to put it as objectivism versus creative freedom, right? Because uh, in the sort of uh, surface level understanding of objectivism, it kind of looks like, um, like a commandment from the mountain saying, thou shalt be serious, thou shalt not be too imaginative, thou shalt sit up straight and only work on architecture because it is a rational art form. But we're going to try and be a little bit deeper than that. And we've got a, our, our uh, newest, one of our newest co-hosts here today who, let me tell you, most people don't know this, but before he became an acclaimed podcast co-host, he actually was a working actor. Working, they paid him. And um, he's here to, uh, fortunately, the Moratorium on Civilization gave him the free time to join us here today. Please welcome Mark Pellegrino. <laughs> Uh, all right, you really can tie things together that don't go together. So um, you got yeah. my props. We were uh, talking before we began, uh, before we came on the air about how um, we need to connect creativity to the fact that it's Freedom Friday. And I said, I can connect anything to anything. Um, so um, let's first talk about just creativity as such. Now, as a lyricist, I think it's pretty clear that I'm engaged in creative work. I mean, most people hold that against me. They say, how, how, how could you write that? Like, why would you want to write something so, so wrong? But when it comes to actors, a lot of people, a lot of people, they don't think uh, acting is actual creative work. They think all you guys do is smoke drugs and someone hands you a script and you, you're basically paid to be on camera, you know, saying the words and then you go home to your life of luxury and copious drugs. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm dressing this up with some uh, with some <laughs> drug imagery, but I mean, but essentially, how would you respond to people who who, who might think that's the case? Um, that's why they don't become actors, and that's why lots of people don't become rock stars because uh, once you actually succeed at a craft like acting or music, you you discover that your your mistress and your love, uh, the thing that you a thing and and the thing that you devote most of your time to is your craft. You know, you see Eddie Van Halen on stage, you don't see the nine and a half hours a day that he practices on the guitar or that he sleeps with it and goes to bed playing scales. And with the actor, you don't see the amount of time they put in reading plays, breaking plays down, trying to understand what the, what the spine of the characters are, what the theme of the play is, and then trying to embody that in a performance, which is not easy, especially with, especially given the fact that you, you're creating human moments um, uh, under circumstances that are uniquely um, conspiring against the reality of those human moments. Being on stage in front of people and acting like you're not takes a great deal of concentration and skill. And acting in front of a camera is not easy. It's a, it's a piece of impersonal uh, machinery that is in your face, and creates an artifice uh, to a situation that you can't really appreciate until you're there on the scene, actually watching the skill it takes and the concentration it takes to be human under those circumstances. But I wanted to follow up with something in your, your monologue. I do find that 
I, I've been a sort of connoisseur of acting schools and teachers and, and have taught many years myself and have, have except with the exception of me, never found an acting teacher that didn't in some way split the human creative faculty into the mind and the body and the instincts in the body being the primary and the mind being something that should be, uh, that would be mostly an obstacle to your creative process. That sounds uh, like quite a, uh, quite a theory of acting or teaching acting. Um, is there anything more you can sort of share about that or do we need to sign up well, for your I, class? No, I mean, I, 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 I rail against that because I, I don't think human beings are instinctual beings and I don't think that they're, they're just reactive. I think they're, all of that stuff is informed by the mind on some level and your mind, your mind is a very powerful part of the creative process. But it's a part of the creative process in the sense that in the rehearsal process with acting, it's about automatizing a point of view so that you don't have to think about it so that it becomes automatic when you're actually performing it. It's not about, it's not about erasing your brain from the creative process, but many actors think that when you tell an actor you're in your head, get out of your head, they, they, begin, to, they begin to make an enemy of their mind. Seriously. So I never used those terms when I was teaching. I rebelled against the, the, that idea of you're in your head. Um, I, I used other terms to try to, to make sure that the actor from the very beginning never established uh, uh, that kind of relationship with his brain, but always integrated in, into his work from the beginning. Yeah, it, it becomes a very difficult um, dichotomy to contend with when you tell people first you tell them you're in your head but then you're trying to explain to them but well no 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 don't don't completely uh the drain the baby with the bath water like there is there is a kernel of truth in that uh cliche uh, you know that you're in your head like we're trying to get people to let their guard down i guess is that a good way to put it um sure you're trying to get them not to edit themselves you're trying to get them to tell the truth what's going on in the moment without any idea about how it should be just like you are in life we're, we're we're not necessarily guided by how we think the moment should go we're listening to to each other and reacting based on what we know and that's the kind of spontaneity you want to bring to the work and and getting it saying getting it get, you're in your head is sort of a nice shorthand way of saying it but i think it eventually makes somebody an enemy of their own brain Yes. Now, uh, there's sort of um, there's sort of the perspective out there in the culture, probably popular among conservatives, that like actors are largely sort of uh, leftist or very like anti-authority because they want to feel like free children that get to play pretend. I, I mean, would you agree? I mean, acting it, it is a discipline. It does require you to sort of um, um, to stop like policing yourself in a, in a respect, but like it's like, but like many other art forms or all art forms, that's not the same as dispensing with the facts and, uh, and the rules of, of existence. I, I agree with you, but I, I do think art took that nihilistic turn at some point. Um, they started trying to free themselves from what I think they considered constraints, but while doing that, which is great, experiment with with the way an art can go, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the midst of doing that, they threw away everything, in, including laws of reality and nature, and, and thought that they were uh, expanding art by, by annihilating what made it possible. So I, I can't tell you the number of people I think, uh, the number of actors who think that just pure, pure inhib lack of inhibition, lack of shame, uh, is is a it makes you makes you a, a, a potentially powerful actor, and that, that, I don't think that's true necessarily. Do you see um, a, a lot of commonality between uh, scripted acting versus improvisation? Like, do you see a similar kind of uh, skill there? Um, because improvisation, if people don't know, it's like you basically you step out onto the stage and you just start making <coughs> stuff up, whatever your subconscious sends you, and then you kind of turn it into a scene. Whereas with acting, obviously, you sort of, uh, you study this character, you, you memorize, you learn to kind of channel and become this character. Do you see a difference between those two types of acting? Um, are they more alike than they are different? Uh, or I mean, I, I, think that, I think the improvisation, the type of improvisation that you're talking about requires a, a much quicker wit and engagement of your brain fully in the process of, of creation. Because you're making dialogue up in the moment. And, and uh, 
and it's often funny and, and interesting. Um, and that, that's a whole different talent, uh, I think. It's a great talent to incorporate, if you have it, into your, into your acting work. That's why I think very good comedians also make very good actors, <laughs> um, because they've integrated their minds and their feelings. Uh, they've thought about their feelings a great deal. They've done sets about their feelings and spinning their feelings in funny and entertaining ways. And so uh, they're really good at incorporating their, their whole being into, uh, in, into a piece uh, much, much better than, than just the normal everyday average person. Uh, but it is, it is a different uh, skill set in, in the integration of the brain <laughs> with, mm -hmm. with the moment. Now, uh, interesting. Now, Ayn Rand um, said something, I think in one of her Q&A. So this is not like import, her important work. This is kind mm -hmm. of something she, she shared uh, at a Q and A uh, about chess, like she thought chess was um, like it's not healthy to play too much of it. I'm I'm trying to paraphrase what what she said. Like like people who play too much chess, it like teaches them to think about every possible hypothetical thing that could happen, which is not a useful way to think in any any anything other than chess. So like reality doesn't usually ask you, like require you to think of all these various different hypotheticals. And so she had kind of, um, she had kind of a negative view of chess. And I have, I've had a bit of a hypothesis, and, but it's, it's hard to know uh, how right it is, that people that do too much improvisation, like people that are on the, at the improv theater every day, constantly doing improv, it might, um, it might harm their ability to function well, because they're just constantly, um, kind of dropping dropping all context and jumping into something brand new and the sort of evidence quote unquote because it's very tentative is that many people who live in that those circles are schlumpy schlubby and just generally um you know not the uh, highest of functioning people but you but maybe that's just because they're you know they're they're in the sort of alternative uh, hipster side of town that that they are that way. It's not necessarily that they're impro improvising too much. So that's a sort of a hypothesis I've had. I don't know if, uh, if you have any thoughts about that. Well, I mean, I think, I think what you're saying, here's how I'm translating it. When, when, you're, when you're doing all that improvisation, you're on. And so that uh, if you're doing it too much, then even in life, you're on. And that's a rather annoying and unhealthy place to be. And if and actually, it's the reverse of what you learn if you're learning very good acting technique. You're learning not to be on. You're learning to be authentic and who you are and to tell the truth um, from, from whatever perspective. So uh, yeah, I could see how being on all the time would be uh, not only damaging to them, but annoying to anybody around them. <laughs> who not wants only, that? Not only on, but like, on so, in a new character like every like every time somebody claps like you're just jumping in and out of this universe and constantly just saying whatever you know whatever uh you you immediately think of saying just like constantly jumping in and out of these different realities um i've thought maybe maybe maybe, maybe you're putting your finger on the reason why robin williams was so unhappy i mean when you ever, whenever i saw him interviewed i saw a desperate neur neurotic human being drowning at the deep end of a pool every time I saw him on, on an interview show and it was disturbing. And when I watched his acting, he couldn't, he couldn't release while he, when he acted and it was hard for me to watch him uh, when he acted. So uh, look, you're, you're, there's a prime example of somebody I think who, who follows that, that profile. Yeah. Well, and remember guys, keyword is maybe, I mean, this is uh, there's a lot of evidence. I don't have, there's a lot, we don't, people are complicated and these are complicated things. Um, so, Let's talk about creativity versus discipline or like, um, uh, uh, you know, you discovered objectivism at some point and became like a serious student of objectivism. Did you ever feel like, um, like there is a, there is a contradiction between these two or like you had to pick one over the other in the early stages of studying the philosophy? No, I don't think I considered it very deeply um, when I first started studying the philosophy. And now I understand that discipline is pretty much the only way you can be creative. Um, you, you really, it, it really is true that, that creativity is 99% is perspiration. I mean, any great uh, creator that I've ever known, what they're really good at is sitting their butt in the seat and getting it done. 
Um, they don't wait for inspiration. They make inspiration happen after thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of fails and hundreds of improvisations that don't work where they don't find the character. Remember Seymour Hoff uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman talked about working on Capote. I mean, he worked on that character for hours and hours and hours and hours of failed <laughs> fail fails until he finally landed the the phys physiognomy, whatever you want to call it, the physical characteristics and vocal characteristics that work for the part in him. So you never kind of picked up any kind of uh, like before, before Ayn Rand, were there any sort of uh, thinking errors that maybe you picked up from acting, cl acting class, acting school, where they told you, get out of your head, get in your head, all these things that you later had to kind of untangle. Um, any, anything? I mean, yeah, I think, I, think, I think that's true. I think what I talked about earlier mm -hmm. is that, you know, definitely acting teachers set you up in that sort of, to be at war with your, with your brain. Um, but um, it, was never, it was never a huge obstacle for me to overcome for some reason. I'm not even sure why, I haven't thought about it. I, I was able to, to integrate the principles fairly seamlessly without, without feeling like uh, I was crashing into something. So maybe that's just me. Nice. Well, you know, some women, uh, they give birth and it just doesn't hurt that much. You know, sometimes beautiful <laughs> things can come about and it doesn't necessarily need to be painful. Um, so um, now how about like the content? Um, you know, let's be honest, most of what's popular these days is not romantic realism and not all of it's bad, but it's just not, it's not as good as maybe what art can be. Um, and uh, I guess going back to this sort of early stages of studying objectivism or any time since then, did you ever have these moments where, you know, there's a great philosopher named Danny Bonaducci and he talks about his, I think his father would write sitcoms like uh, the one with Dynamite. Which one was that? The Jeffersons? Uh, uh, no, that was Good time. Oh, wait, Good, good times. times. Good Times. Yeah. So uh, Danny Bonaducci used to hear his father in the next room, like having meltdowns and screaming, Dynamite! Dynamite! I was born in the wrong century and throwing stuff around. So that, that line, I was born in the wrong century, kind of, um, it stuck with me. And I'm, did you ever feel that way? Like you're reading a script and you're maybe at like you just, you just finished reading The Fountainhead and you're just sort of like in this trance where you're like, here's what art can be, here's what man can be. And now I'm, you know, I'm just take, I'm, I'm in Hollywood hoping to land any job. And, and this script is just, it just kind of seems superficial by comparison. You ever, is, does any of this uh, resonate with you? <laughs> um. N not necessarily. I mean, um, I, I might resonate with the with the uh, with the the gritty realistic uh, genre a little bit more than you. Uh, I mean, I could I could still I could still sort of chafe at you know the more nihilistic elements of it, but appreciate so many other aspects of it that it, it doesn't make me feel like I'm an anachronism. You know, I I feel like. Um, I feel like the the writing uh, for most shows, and you can correct me if if I'm wrong, has has actually in, improved in the sense that the characters are are far more complex and interesting. And and as much as we might not like flaws, those flaws make them identifiable to me in a way. Um, so uh, and, and the heroism may not be. Vast. It may not be big, earth-shaking, earth-shattering, universe-changing, premise-changing heroism that you know Rand could bring to us, but it's it's heroism on a smaller scale, the, the scale of the neighborhood and the family, in a way that I think is accessible to people too. Um, and and so maybe I'm wrong. I, where I feel like I'm in the wrong century is you know when I talk to my fellow actors uh, about politics or or when I'm looking at the political scene in general, I feel like I was, I should have been born in the American Enlightenment and not today. Um, but literally, look, I'm, 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 I'm one of those uh, lovers of Rand who's not necessarily on board with her writing style and, and think it could be even more interesting, uh, differently said. Well, uh, hold on, <laughs> cut this man off. No, listen, um, by the way, I'm, I'm the, you know, I'm the king of uh, enjoying popular culture and finding values in it. I was largely inspired as a kid by punk rock. I mean, these are not popular positions to hold among objectivists. So my questions were not so much like, 
don't you agree that most art is crap? My point was, tell us about your journey. Did you ever struggle with this? And it sounds like you've had a pretty good kind of integrated approach, maybe from the very start and where you never felt like you had to renounce uh, your past or your, or your values in favor of this uh, Atlantis that Ayn Rand is, uh, is, is, is writing up. Um, I just feel like I just feel like since I didn't know everything from the beginning, it was a stepping stone to something bigger and better. I, I'm glad I was able to see it finally. That's all. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, you know, if uh, any any other liberty minded podcast that has you on, I imagine the first question is, how do you deal with all those leftists in Hollywood? But here we go a little bit deeper. We go back down to the more essential stuff. And we work our way up to finally towards the very last moment you mentioning, oh man, those other actors, I can't deal with them. Um, but is there any, uh, any is, it, is, that, is this a real struggle? Have you lost sleep? Have you had lost friendships? Have you um, felt alienated in a, in a serious way from being sort of a, um, an atomized uh, rational thinker among the e egalitarian nihilists? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, the bad news is they, they, they work in stealthy ways and it's possible that these things are going on behind the scenes and that I will one day experience being uh, ostracized by this community. At the moment, they seem to not know how to uh, categorize me. They only, they only have the binary sort of p political view in their heads. It's only Democrat or Republican, conservative or leftist. And uh, anything that falls uh, outside of that box is sort of uh, incomprehensible to them. Um, and, and the good news about being incomprehensible to them is that I can talk to them and make them think about things in a way that they haven't thought of uh, before. And so in many ways, uh, the Hollywood community is receptive as well. Um, but, you know, I, I tend to stick my, 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 my uh, my nose into business that I probably shouldn't on social media, and and if I see somebody virtue signaling and they are a big Hollywood person, I'll still stick my nose in it and punch them in the face uh, with words if I can. And that's not necessarily a healthy impulse, but I'm doing it. You're doing it. Um, yeah, it's. Um, I think the left has always had kind of a soft spot for Ayn Rand. You know, they like they don't really. They, they should see her as a threat, but like Harry Binswanger talks about when the leftists were blowing things up in the, around college campuses uh, in the 60s or 70s. Uh, for some reason, the objectivist club was sort of left alone. Now, it's possible, like I think maybe you alluded to, we're just not on their radar. They're, they're not sure how to categorize us, but uh, I like to think there's a little bit of good in everyone. I know that's not another unpopular uh, cliche to utter around objectivists, but like a certain, the, to the degree people are alive and with some place for values in their life, there's something about Ayn Rand that uh, they're just not ready to blow up yet. Um, but yeah, this, is, uh, this has been a fascinating conversation and uh, we're going to get part two, part three. We're, we're going to put do like, uh, like the uh, Star Trek movies and, and all the other reboots. We're going to have this conversation in an unending form and it's going to go on forever until all these problems <laughs> are put to rest. But uh, be careful out there on social media. That's all I can say. People's lives have been devastated. And uh, I would not want to see that happen. Thank you all for joining us. Everyone have a wonderful and free weekend. And uh, remember, uh, have good premises out there. Goodbye.